What's up everyone and thanks for joining me again this week. Today is gonna be the final episode of my series on reading and using execution plans to troubleshoot poor performing queries and specifically, I'm gonna show you how I troubleshoot a query. Oh yeah, and if you're just starting with this episode, you might wanna go back to the first episode in this series. I'll link to it below in the description uh, so you can kinda of get caught up on all the basics of reading execution plans. All right, so the first step I take when troubleshooting a poor performing query is to actually get the query into SQL Server Management Studio and get an execution plan for it. My typical process for that looks like this. I'll take the query and I, I paste it into my window and I actually open up a second query window with the same exact query in it. Um, and let's just make sure I'm looking at my right database is perfect. And so what I'll do is in this first window, I will get my estimated execution plan. And in the second window, I actually typically open it as a new vertical tab group and choose my actual execution plan and hit execute there. What this does is it allows me not to waste any time. And since estimated and actual plans are the same, um, besides just the actual runtime statistics on, on the you know, rows processed and things like that that appear on the actual plan, uh, it doesn't hurt to start looking at the estimated plan and then switch over to the actual plan once it becomes available. And by having these two windows side by side, uh, it makes it pretty easy for me to see when the other query finishes executing and I can switch over to that actual execution plan. So I know a lot of people like taking a different approach. If the query plan was already in a cache, they may look at that first before actually going to execute the query again. But I like re-executing the query because it gives me a few extra pieces of information. For one thing, it will tell me if this query is still experiencing poor performance or if it was just some uh, thing that was happening at an earlier point in time. Now this can sometimes be misleading because when you copy and paste the query into a new query window and run it, it may not be able to actually get the cached version of that query because of some difference in white space or something like that. So it's just something you need to be aware of, right? If you re-execute the query and it runs instantly, uh, it, that doesn't mean your problem is solved and you need to ignore it. It's just it's that, oh, okay, well, it didn't pull the plan from cache maybe, and I do need to go look at that cache plan, or maybe, right, there's a parameter sniffing issue with, with my plan that's in cache, and so, uh, you know, then I go investigating down that route. But I like rerunning the query for that purpose, and I also like rerunning the query, especially if it's sent to me, you know, from someone else, from one of my colleagues. It's not that I don't trust them when they tell me that, hey, this query is running poorly or something like that, but I just wanna verify it for myself, right? Trust but verify. Uh, I wanna make sure, you know, right off the bat to just eliminate any potential issues of, right, someone not drinking enough coffee that morning and, and doing something, you know, accidentally wrong that was causing it to look like a query was performing, uh, you know, poorly. Um, I rather just execute it myself and actually see that it's not working. Finally, it's not always possible to get an actual execution plan in a timely manner, right? Sometimes you may get a query that just runs for seemingly ever, right? And you don't want to wait around all day or you know leave it open until the next day to be able to retrieve an actual plan, right? For queries that are really, really bad. In those cases, what I like to do is to use live query statistics. So I don't use live query statistics all the time because there is a little bit of overhead in, in having SQL Server Management Studio display uh, kind of all of that real-time information about what's happening in your query. But if we have a query that isn't finishing, we can go turn that on by pressing this button here and then pressing execute and we'll know in real time what's happening with our query. This is really beneficial because we can actually watch each operator complete from right to left and if we get to an operator that is taking a very long time, uh, it's pretty safe to say that that is our bottleneck or at least one bottleneck right, as part of our plan. Watching the live query statistics will also tip us off if we are having uh, weird estimation problems, right? Because the, the numbers of rows are displayed in the live query statistics view and so if suddenly if the real-time number of rows being processed starts greatly exceeding our estimate, we'll know we have some statistics issues there. All right, so once I'm viewing any one of these plans, right, it doesn't really matter if it's the estimated or actual plan or I'm viewing it with live query statistics on, the first thing I look for are unexpected seeks or scans. So as a general rule, if I see a lot of non-clustered indexes being used, um, I at least feel a little bit better because I know that uh, there has been some thought about indexing these tables and at the very least, right, things like select star aren't happening because SQL Server is able to find a covering index to be able to pull all the data from. Right? It's a totally different story if I see uh, table scans or something like that where I'm just missing indexes completely. Um, those are actually great. They're very low hanging fruit. I just 
throw on a clustered index before I do anything else. Um, and, and hopefully, right, I'll get a little bit of a performance boost there. But looking at my scans and seeks, right, I just use common sense. If I know my query is using a lot of predicates and it should be filtering out my data, you know, pretty substantially, uh, then I'm hoping that I'm not going to be seeing you know, clustered index scans are non-clustered index scans, right, which are going and scanning across all the rows in that index. You know, that would be an immediate tip off that maybe some of my predicate filters aren't being applied at that index level. Um, and it's probably something I want to revisit. And I take a closer look at index seeks as well, right? One common pattern you may see is something like a non-clustered index seek that then goes and does a lookup in our clustered index because that original non-clustered index doesn't have all the information, all the columns that our query is requesting of. It. And this key lookup pattern, once again, isn't necessarily always a bad thing, uh, but it does represent an opportunity for being able to do something simple, like maybe just add one more column uh, to our non-clustered index, and SQL Server will be able to avoid that uh, you know, ex fairly expensive key lookup uh, process altogether. And really, looking at all these seeks and scans is a pretty quick pass. I'm trying to figure out is, is there inefficiency in the very first step of where SQL Server is retrieving that data. All right, the next thing I typically look for are inaccuracies in row estimates. And so I won't go through every operator necessarily to check this, but I'll look for a couple key things like arrow sizes that are, are much larger than maybe I would expect. Um, I would then dive into those operators to look to see if my estimated versus my actual number of rows is greatly different. Um, if I'm using live query statistics, I may immediately see a bottleneck right with my actual live row counts showing um, that the estimates are inaccurate there. So I may decide to focus in on an operator that way. And I may look at the costs of different operators, even though I know that they are not always perfectly accurate. Um, taking a look at those costs can somehow sometimes also help you track down where you are having these inaccuracies between estimated numbers of rows and the actual number of rows the SQL Server is processing. So if I do find an operator that is just totally estimating the wrong number of rows um, by like a factor of 100, um, right? So if, if I have an estimate of 100 rows and is SQL Server is actually returning 10,000 rows, right? 100 times more rows, uh, that is cause for concern, right? If the estimated and actual numbers are pretty close, I don't worry about it, but if it's more than 100, uh, times greater, it usually means that there's some room for improvement with helping SQL Server improve its estimates. And it's important to kind of capture those, uh, like I mentioned in one of the previous videos I did in this series, right? If the statistics are totally wrong on the table and SQL Server is throwing out these crazy estimates that are inaccurate, your query is only going to get worse the further and further it goes down the execution plan because once an estimate, right, is wrong and SQL Server, you know, builds a plan based on an incorrect estimate, everything else that it does after that will probably just get worse and worse. So it's important to fix these kinds of estimate issues as soon as they come up. And also usually when looking at these estimated versus actual number of rows um, is when I consider whether I'm having parameter sniffing issues. As a quick test, I may throw an option recompile uh, onto the bottom of my query um, and I re-execute my query and it runs pretty quickly um, and, or my execution plan looks drastically different. I know I maybe have a parameter sniffing issue. At that point, right, I, the plan in the cache was built based on one value being passed into a certain predicate. Um, but now, whatever value I'm passing into my query now, uh, it has vastly different estimates. The data is distributed differently, and SQL Server is using a cached plan that really isn't optimal for my new parameter. All right, once I finish looking at any row estimate inaccuracies, I start looking for other suspicious operators. These are things like sorts and spools and hash joins. And I did a whole video about this. It's actually the last video in the series. So just go watch that if you haven't already. And I want to rehash it all here um, but I, I do keep my eyes open for these operators that typically you know I find give me trouble in slow performing queries and so if I see them I'll go investigate them further and see if there's anything I need to do and so finally the last thing I do is look for any little yellow exclamation point uh, warnings on any of my operators. These warning indicators sometimes are completely inconsequential, right? SQL Server will throw a warning for something that you really don't care about, like, okay, SQL Server overestimated the amount of memory it needed, but it overestimated it by like half a megabyte or something. So it doesn't, you know, 
who cares? It's that's close enough. But other times you may find that SQL Server just truly misestimated the amount of memory it needs. It gave a poor memory grant and that caused a bunch of data to spill to tempdb. Um, and as we know, right, writing to tempdb is bad for performance and that you know slowed things down. That's the kind of warning message that I'm looking for. Another type of warning that typically causes me to act in some way is seeing something like an implicit conversion warning, which is preventing SQL Server from doing an index seek and just going directly to the data it needs, right? It's causing SQL Server to scan the data, which is slow and inefficient. Um, so those warnings are just something to look at. Know that they always don't, you know, they won't always cause you to do something about them, uh, but sometimes they can provide pretty good insight into where the problem spot of your query is. And so in summary, right, this is how I typically approach a query, but you have to be aware of, you know, the context of I'm a developer, um, I'm not a DBA, I, you know, am generally dealing with my own queries or queries in applications that I'm very familiar with. So I already have some background knowledge of, you know, how these queries should be running or how they should be interacting with the data. Um, if I definitely was a DBA managing, you know, several different servers with lots of different databases, hosting, you know, different applications that I'm not familiar with, I may take a different approach. I may, you know, holistically look at my server and tune queries that way and look at the plans that are in cache first before re-executing any queries because it may not be easy for me to reproduce, you know, a certain scenario. So. It, it really, you know, take all this with a grain of salt. This is what works for me and, you know, use it, adapt it, try it if you've never done this before. And then over time, as you practice it and become, you know, more comfortable with it, you're de you'll develop your own techniques on, you know, doing what works for you. So thanks again for tuning in to this series. I hope you all enjoyed it. I know this is one of my most requested uh, videos that, you know, people always told me they wanted to see. So, you know, leave a comment below if this worked for you, or if you still have any remaining questions maybe I'll do a follow-up video in a few weeks uh, if I get enough of those otherwise uh, if you are not already a subscriber be sure to subscribe and I'll see you next time thanks mm -hmm.